Hi, um, my, well, I'm calling myself Mr. Protester at the moment, and I'm out here living on the sidewalk of the Supreme Court. I've been here since October 3rd because I have an original jurisdiction case that hasn't been heard, and this year is 20 years without due process. So basically, Abraham Lincoln settled an issue during the Civil War, and the issue he settled is that there's no statehood outside of the Union. The way you look at it is like in logic, when you have necessary and sufficient conditions. When you have necessary and sufficient conditions, it means that the elements are so interrelated with each other, such that if an element exist it is sufficient to call the other element into existence and it does so necessarily if the elements share this relationship this interrelationship then what happens is it arises to identity for either all the elements exist or none of them do this is how Lincoln saw the Union there is no state so statehood outside of the Union and there is no Union without statehood because it's an interrelationship that's sufficient and necessary of itself. You cannot leave the Union because to leave the Union is to make the end of the Union. So the people are the ones that instituted the states and instituted the government. So when you look at states rights and sovereign immunity you can realize that it's a lie. If you look at the Tenth Amendment the Tenth Amendment doesn't say states have rights. What it says is states and people's powers. The Ninth Amendment says people's rights. So we have two amendments, one dealing with rights, one dealing with powers. People are in both, but the states are only in one. And I don't think the Founding Fathers ran out of ink. In addition to the fact that if they wanted states to have rights, they could have put states and people's rights in the Ninth Amendment the way they put states and people's powers in the Tenth. They also could have conflated the two amendments and put people and states' rights and powers. But they didn't do this, and that's because they clearly knew that people have rights and people have powers. And we take some of our powers, give it to the state, and give it to the Union in order that we can secure to ourselves our God-given us endowed by our creator rights amongst them being the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness so with that background you can kind of understand the original jurisdiction case when the state of utah passed laws that were unconstitutional that's one thing but then when they decide to play it cute and clever and try to protect the unconstitutional laws from being struck down by creating a firewall in this lie of states rights in order to acquire sovereign immunity and tell this court not to hear the case they make an error because when they pass an article to their state constitution to do that they become a party to the cause which means they have a vested interest in upholding their state constitution because they take an oath to God to uphold it and therefore they become incompetent to take jurisdiction over the case and thus it triggers original jurisdiction under article 3 of the United States Constitution if you read it it says that if a pay part uh, state is a party to a cause the Supreme Court shall hold original jurisdiction that's mandatory language which means it's not certiori this court cannot pick and choose the case. The case must be heard. We cannot tolerate a situation where the states start passing articles to their state constitution that violate the United States Constitution. So that's the uh, philosophical background and legal background on why the case has to be heard here at the Supreme Court and goes right from West Valley City, Utah directly here. Now I'll tell you about the law specifically so you can understand. They've passed laws in Utah called the Victims' Rights Laws, which sound really nice, but when somebody's committing treason, they don't usually dress up in the Hamburglar gear with the black and white striped shirts and the mask and say, I'm here to commit treason. What they do is they dress up like a patriot and con you into believing that what they're doing is good for you while they get you into endless wars and bankrupt your treasury and destroy your country from the inside. And so the victim's right to a speedy trial sounds really good but we have to analyze it. We can't just say amen to it, we gotta think. In my case, the police showed up and saw that these people didn't wanna pay me for my carpentry work. They were trying to steal from me and they were trying to use the police to do it. The police took evidence, saw that they were making false accusations, clear and unequivocal evidence existed. And so they didn't arrest me. They used the so-called victim, who's actually a false accuser's phone, to call me a taxi, help me gather my tools up, put them in the taxi, and sent me home. Now, the state of Utah, for some reason that I can't explain, decided to go against the call of the police, and they made the right call and decided to prosecute me anyways. The judge dated and signed the subpoenas for the day after trial so the police couldn't show up, so I could ask them a simple question under oath. Why did you use their phone to call me a taxi and send me home instead of arresting me? And they could have said, because you were innocent and here's the evidence. So when the judge denies my continuance motion saying that the victims have a right to a speedy trial, it's in error. In my case, I know they're false accusers. But let's take a step back and consider the case where the crime is committed and the victimhood is real and assured. Even in such a case, 
the guy on trial still might be innocent because they might have caught the wrong guy. Because he's innocent till proven guilty, and until they change that in the canon of the American law, it is the law. Because he's innocent till proven guilty, until he's convicted, he's not the perpetrator, even if the victimhood is real. In my case, they're not victims. But even if they were victims, until you're convicted, they're not victims of yours. And therefore, their rights as victims aren't operative at your trial. And therefore, the right to a speedy trial for the victim isn't an actual right. It's an anti-right that takes away the defendant's rights to raise an adequate defense under the Fifth Amendment, like in my case, where I wanted subpoenas dated and signed for the day of trial, so the police could show up and tell the truth. So this is the thing. It's not a right, it's an anti-right, and they tried to protect it by passing an article to their state constitution so that they could create a firewall on states' rights and sovereign immunity. Now, what's sovereign immunity? Back in the day when the Wigamores wanted a reform, they were working with a tyrannical monarch, a guy that had absolute power that supposedly ruled by the divine right of kings. And so the Wigamores needed to come up with an argument to get the king to agree to a judiciary. So they said to him, look, king, out of your treasury, you fund the earls, and every time they get into a dispute, uh, you decide the issue, and one of them's upset with you. Over time, they gather together and usurp you and become king. And this wasn't some argument they came up with. It was real. Back in the day, the kings used to serve maybe for 10 years before somebody would lop their head off and then their family would rule by divine right. And so it was a very real um, issue that resonated with the king. But the king said, well, it sounds like a good idea that I can stay above the fray and you guys can settle these issues for me, but it also sounds like you want your power and I'm not giving it to you. And that's why they came up with the doctrine of sovereign immunity. Acknowledging that the king was an absolute ruler, they said, we will grant you sovereign immunity. If you invoke it, you don't have to lawyer up, you don't need a reason. If you invoke it, the case won't lay. But you agree at initio that if you don't invoke your sovereign immunity and the case is heard, you will not disturb the decision so that the judiciary would not be coincided to the junk bins of history as a joke and a failure because of arbitrary disruption of the decisions by the king who had absolute power. That was the compromise, that was the deal. It has nothing to do with a republic, especially a republic that overthrew that British king. So therefore, there's no sovereign immunity and the reason why they argue about states rights which is a lie if you read the ninth and tenth amendment you can see that is because if they argued about sovereign immunity you'd say hey wait a second we're not british we don't believe in sovereigns here in america so they take your eye off the prize by focusing the argument on the lie of states rights and then when they win that argument, they get sovereign immunity, which allows them to tell this court not to hear the case. So the judge and court clerk in my case refused to stamp the notice of appeal and mail it to the court of appropriate jurisdiction, which is the Supreme Court. And so they've left me twisting in the wind for 20 years. I've written 1,500 emails to these clowns in Congress. I've dealt with three administrations, Gonzalez, Alder, and Ashcroft and I've got no more moves to make, so I'm living here on the sidewalk to try to get my case heard. In addition to that, I'd like to support everybody who comes out here and exercises their First Amendment right, and uh, I just appreciate everybody who takes the time to talk to me and videotape me and take pictures. God bless you, and God bless America. Sure. Now, I see that you had to sign sure. uh, abolish abortion. Oh, How would you feel about our government or Congress funding an adoption program? That's exactly what I believe. God bless you. Instead of abortions, why don't we, like, this is what There's I was... so much wasteful government spending. Let's fund it to stuff that's going to benefit the people. Well, this is the thing. It's not just about the right to life. It's also about the quality of life once the kid gets here. I've talked to so many people that say, no, I don't believe in abortion, but I also want to gut social programs. And it's like, look, man... I don't believe in the distribution of wealth because I'm not a communist, but I don't believe in the distribution of wealth upwards because I'm not an imbecile. These people are raping the treasury and they're transferring the wealth to a bunch of dudes that are already rich and powerful, engaging this country in war profiteering anarchy because they can't sign a contract and get the oil, so they gotta blow people up to steal it. So we gotta stop this nonsense. Capitalism is what we believe in, not corporal fascism. So we gotta get back to our foundation, we have to acknowledge people's right to life, and then, once they're alive, we've gotta make sure that they're not enslaved with debt that they cannot pay. Right now, Republicans and Democrats have a joke argument, and all they're doing is putting a tax on a people that aren't even born yet. It is a burden they will never get out from under that yoke, and it is it is just egregious. It's egregious to do that. When I go into a bank and I borrow money, there's two things that make it fair. Number one, I get the use of the instrument. Number two, I get to agree to terms. When somebody isn't even born yet and they're having a debt put on them, not only do they not get the use of the instrument, but they don't get to agree to the terms that they have to pay back. It is egregious. One last question for you, sure. sir. How do you feel about the Federal Reserve? 
Well, I believe that John Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln had two things in common. They had an honest dollar, and they both got their brains blown out over their beautiful wife's faces. With Lincoln, it was the greenback. With John Kennedy, he was a Democrat, so he did it a different way. He started circulating the silverback treasury demand note to compete with the Federal Reserve, knowing that the American people, not being imbeciles like the people that are leading them currently, would definitely go into a bank and demand a demand note because in a demand note, you go into the bank, you can ask for silver and you get the weight in silver. They don't take you to the nut bin and throw you in the and start putting you under treatment. So the Federal Reserve note is not backed by any commodity. John Kennedy's silverback treasury note was, and therefore it was a honest dollar and it wasn't fiat currency. With fiat currency, what they do is, say I deposited $100 at the bank. The bank would then turn around and print $10,000 and put it into circulation. Now, George Washington wanted to make it a capital offense to do that because when you print money that isn't backed by reserves, and let's, let's just put all this nonsense aside, take a step back and shake our heads. All wealth in a country is not created by printing money. All, all the wealth, 100% of the wealth is created by the goods and services produced in that country. The money just represents the value of it. If you print $10 billion and produce 10 goods, you've devalued everybody's productivity. It is enslavement. And the founding fathers wanted to make it a capital offense if they sent an auditor into a bank and he was printing more money than he could back up with his reserves off with his head. Well, maybe maybe they shouldn't have pulled Washington back and 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 uh, told him he was wrong about that. Maybe he was right about that because what's going on today is just nonsense. And you know what? It's unsustainable. One last thought. China has $3 trillion of U.S. currency currently. They have 1,000 tons of gold. We have 8,000 tons of gold. In 2006, gold was trading at $299 an ounce. Now it's over, well, it's hit $1,700 an ounce. Ask yourself a question. Why does a nation state say, I'm not going to take $3 trillion of a foreign country's currency and invest it in gold and quintuple my investment? What would make that currency more valuable as currency rather than gold? It's a weapon. And when these clowns are finished raping our treasury and telling us that banks are too big to fail while individuals aren't too small to fail, China's going to swoop in and use that weapon to have us making the flip-flops for a bowl of rice a day. They haven't forgotten the opium wars. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Ooh, well, it's interesting to me that our own government is watching Facebook in the first place. No kidding. Sergeant, are you having fun? Thank you for protecting us from his penis.